It's a Nobel Prize season in Sweden and Norway. It's the world's most prestigious accolade. But while many laureates are celebrated, others have attracted controversy. So is the Nobel Prize still relevant? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Peter Dobby. The Nobel Prize is one of the world's most coveted awards. It recognises the highest achievements in a variety of subjects, from science to literature and economics to peace. Notable winners include Albert Einstein, Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela and Yasser Arafat. But over the years, some have criticised the Nobel Committee and its choices. Laureates will be announced this week in Sweden and in Norway. In an unprecedented move, two prizes for literature will be awarded. Last year's award was cancelled after allegations of sexual misconduct against the husband of a Swedish Academy member. Secret juries select the recipients and the names of the nominees are kept secret for 50 years. There have been some controversies over the past 100 years of the Nobel Prize. US President Barack Obama was given the Peace Prize in 2009, just nine months after he went into the White House. Mr Obama defended the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan in his acceptance speech. Out of the 688 laureates in the science categories, only 21 have been women. Last year, Donna Strickland became the first woman to win the Nobel Prize for Physics in more than 50 years. And only 17 Africans have ever been recognised, most of them for peace and literature. While some laureates' works have proven to be harmful, neurologist Antonio Egas Monez won the prize for medicine in 1949 for developing prefrontal lobotomies. The procedure soon discredited and, of course, banned. OK, let's bring in our guests today. In Oslo, on Skype, we have Henrik Ordal. He is the executive director of the Peace Research Institute in Oslo. In Lancaster, in the UK, we have Derek Gatherer. He's a virologist and a lecturer at the University of Lancaster. Welcome to you. And in Warsaw, on Skype as well, we have David Van. He's a professor of creative writing at the University of Warwick. Welcome to you all, gentlemen. Henrik Ordal in Oslo, coming to you first. The Nobel Prizes, do we still need them? Absolutely. The, the, uh, all the Nobel Prizes are, of course, extremely prestigious. The uh, Peace Prize is the most prestigious award uh, there is in the world, and it both contributes to uh, lift the stories about the local peace engagement that is so important for bringing the world towards more peace, but also, of course, provides the winners with uh, an enormous platform. Derek Gatherer in Lancaster, being the best in your field is no guarantee that you're going to get a Nobel. How come? Uh, I think that if anybody sets out at the beginning of their career to look for a Nobel Prize, they possibly won't, won't get one. Uh, I think that you have to do the best work you can, and then if you chance on something that really is world-changing, then it, w it may well get the recognition of the Nobel Prize Committee, and the prize will come to you. David Van in Warsaw, some prizes are political, like the Peace Prize. Other prizes, like literature, are not. Why is that? I'm not sure anyone would agree that the literature prize is not political. Um, American writers have long felt, for instance, that there's a bias against uh, American writers. Um, uh, Toni Morrison won it in 1992, and then the next time it went to American was just recently to Bob Dylan, who's not a writer, he's a singer. And that's, that was felt as a snub uh, by Americans. And there's also been the perception that other uh, literature peace prizes have been awarded to um, a reward or embarrass one nation or another. Um, they've been viewed as the most political uh, literature prizes in the world, I believe. David, with all due respect, you sound a little bit defensive there. Bob Dylan, if you were my big brother, <laughs> you'd be saying, hang on, hang on. He may not formally be a writer, but he is a poet. His poetry is put to music, so why shouldn't he win a Nobel Prize? <laughs> Uh, it was so disappointing. I love Bob Dylan. I love his music, loved it all my life. Uh, but when you consider the body of work of, of a novelist who has a dozen novels, and you consider those against uh, the lyrics in Bob Dylan's music, that prize seemed to say that what writers are doing doesn't matter. 
it was resented by writers around the world and was a tremendous mistake and embarrassment um, for the Academy in awarding the prize also. He snubbed them and there was nothing for booksellers to sell also. It was a disaster for everyone in the literary world. Henrik Urdahl, does the committee get it wrong sometimes? And is that, if it does get it wrong, is that part of the reason why, say, getting the Peace Prize can be toxic for the recipient? Well, part of the, uh, part of the uh, I would say, the ambition of the committee is to risk that they sometimes get it wrong. Because if you only give prizes that are uh, uncontroversial, uh, it's also hard to not succeed on the important prizes. But I think there are some, some cases in history where most will agree that uh, you know, the prizes were, were not awarded to the right people or for the right causes. Derek Gatherer in Lancaster, when it comes to ordinary people, real people, not scientists, not academia, not writers, not presidents, not prime ministers. What's the, what, what's the plus when it comes, say, to the awarding of the Nobel Science Prizes? I think scientists in general sometimes feel that we're out of touch with the public and, and the Nobel Prize is one of the ways that scientific work can be brought into the full glare uh, of the media and, and the ordinary public can see what, what scientists are doing and, and can see that perhaps that has been life-changing for them or for the next generation uh, from a medical or, or some other point of view. So for, for scientists, I think that the prize remains something very important because it's one of the occasions when uh, we, we can get science out uh, into the general cultural consciousness and that can be very beneficial for future funding. Governments can decide to fund areas that have been awarded Nobel Prizes uh, and so on. Um, also, the, the, the amount of money, the, the prize itself, uh, it, is considerable, although relative to the, the budgets that scientists work on, it, it has diminished slightly. Science is, uh, is much bigger budget nowadays than it, than it used to be, and there's a general recognition that uh, big, big project science is very important. But nevertheless, the money can be important for supplementing uh, the expenses of scientists uh, who, who have been working on, on these breakthroughs. And David, in Warsaw, why is there such a big issue now that people seem to be focusing in on, particularly over the past, say, five years, an issue of diversity here? Oh, that's been important uh, in the literary world, um, uh, but in every part of our lives, I think, it's important that, that everyone be represented, that different voices um, can be noticed on the world stage. And that's one of the great things this prize can offer is worldwide recognition and focus on someone from anywhere in the world. So we want that to be fair, of course. We want it to not have a gender bias, bias and not be racist, not be regional. Um, but what, where the, the prize can best succeed and best offer something is if it brings to our attention, our world attention, someone that we might not have noticed otherwise as we think about our own regional interests. Henrik, when it comes down to those issues of diversity, the issues of gender, the issues of race, would it be too easy to blame the Nobel Committee when in actual fact what we should be saying is, look, the Nobel Committee maybe should work with the, the core skill set providers, the core industries that these people, the recipients, come from, so you make sure you've got more women working in physics, you've got more um, black men working in the field of, say, American literature? Um, yes, I think that's that's uh, that you could argue that uh, that that is um, uh, that's part of the discussion. I think the committee the committees uh, are still trying to uh, look into the issue of diversity and trying to identify good candidates of across countries across uh, of course gender. When it comes to the Peace Prize, uh, especially in the in the early days of the Peace Prize, of course, it was very much a European North American prize. Many white men. Uh, in most recent years, uh, there is a much better balance, and I think perhaps it's it's uh, easier in the uh, domain of the Peace Prize to find worthy candidates sort of across different contexts. If you look at the past uh, ten years since 2010, there is actually a majority of of uh, women winners. There are five uh, women winners and four men uh, since 2010, and and uh, winners from across all the the different continents. Derek, coming to you, however, Donna Strickland won for physics last year. That was the first time in more than five decades that a woman had taken away the physics prize. How can that happen? 
I think that there is an imbalance in some sciences uh, with regard to gender. Uh, in, in my own field, which is biology, uh, that, that is not the case. In fact, my, my PhD supervisor 35 years ago was a, was a woman, and my first postdoctoral supervisor was a woman. She was later went uh, on to be uh, elected a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences in the USA. So in biology, it's never been very unusual to have, to have lots of women in, in quite high positions. Uh, it's true, though, that that hasn't necessarily turned into a lot of Nobel Prizes for women in, in biology. Uh, famously, of course, Rosalind Franklin um, didn't win the Nobel Prize for her role in the discovery of the DNA helix. That went to Watson and Crick um, and Wilkins. But, uh, of course, Rosalind Franklin had, had died by the time the, the, the prize was awarded, and the rules state that you can't, you can't have the prize awarded uh, posthumously. Um, also, that generally there's a, there's a bit of a tension within the award of the prize as to whether it should be given for a single achievement or, or, for, or for lifetime achievement over a long period of time. Um, and we have seen some prizes recently that have been awarded for, for larger pieces of work taking place over longer periods of time. Uh, and that, that, in some instances, ha has led to the award of prizes to women. For instance, Christiana Nusslein Volhart won, won the prize about 15 years ago for her uh, lifetime of work in the field of Drosophila genetics. Whereas if you'd been picking a, a single paper uh, to award the prize on, then possibly she wouldn't have, have won that prize. So it, it is important that we, that we maintain gender balance uh, in the prize uh, award, but also that we're always looking for, for excellence as well, because otherwise we devalue the, um, the, the, the importance of the award. David, do you get the feeling that the, the Nobel Committee is aware of this? I can feel the tweets coming at me in the next 24 hours, because he is four white, middle-class men with grey hair talking about a lack of women, a lack of people of colour, a lack of women of colour. And could it be, dare I say it, that the Nobel Committee is white, middle-class men who kind of hide behind those big oak doors where we take the locked-out shots when we, you know, when the TV news channels go to the live feed, it'll be a white middle-class guy that comes out and says, the prize for physics goes to fill in as applicable. Right. Yeah, I was feeling uncomfortable seeing us all on the screen there thinking, gosh, how are we not going to be accused of the, the same bias? Um, so, yeah, I, I think that... Uh, the, the, as far as I can tell from what I've read online, uh, the Academy has done uh, tremendous work to try to uh, bring in outside uh, observers, uh, participants, to get rid of anyone who was touched at all uh, by the scandal before that led to two convictions for rape. Um, it, it really seems that they're trying to get these, uh, this time this award of, of two years for the Literature Prize to focus on the writing and the prize itself and not on the committee and the scandal. Um, and it, it sounds like they've, they've done a lot to do that, honestly. I mean, the prize is so enormously important and it only has value if it's beyond reproach. I, I got to think that they've done everything possible to try to be beyond reproach this time. And I hope that's the case. And I imagine there's enormous pressure on them for uh, the prize winner to be a woman this time. And, and, I can't imagine that they wouldn't feel that. Henrik Ordahl, say for a second Greta Thunberg, the environmentalist campaigner, the very young environmentalist campaigner, is nominated. In theory, she can't be nominated for the coming prize because she's, she's kind of missed the window of being nominated. But if she is nominated, and maybe even if she doesn't get it, what's the message that that sends out, not just to the world, but also to her generation? Well, actually, we know for a fact that she is nominated. She is nominated by three Norwegian uh, MPs by the deadline, so she can uh, she can win uh, the prize uh, technically. I think uh, her uh, achievements uh, would uh, possibly be part of a uh, greater consideration by the uh, the committee to award. Uh, a prize for uh, youth engagement and uh, youth participation in peace building activities. And we have pointed to a couple of other uh, candidates that we think perhaps are more closer to the topic of the Nobel Peace Prize. But of course, awarding the, uh, uh, the Peace Prize to uh, a youth activist this time would certainly respond to what I think is a very strong sentiment uh, in the international public and uh, would send a very strong signal that the youth are challenging uh, the existing uh, structure, the existing power structure, the 
the uh, current uh, way of thinking uh, in a way that I think would be very helpful and very useful. David in Warsaw, why is it certain winners, particularly of the Peace Prize, apparently find it difficult to, to, to live up to that moral standard that's been laid down in front of them with, with the awarding of the prize? I mean, people like Aung San Suu Kyi, you know, yes, the world loved her, of course it did, for the right reasons at the right time in the right place. However, over the past, what, three, four years, because of what her country has or has not done over the Rohingya Muslim crisis, the world is re-evaluating who she is and whether she should have got the prize in the first place. Yeah, certainly for Obama, um, it was, uh, uh, it seemed like the prize was a request and a request that he denied. And so it seemed like a, a tremendous uh, disappointment and embarrassment. Um, I voted for Obama, uh, certainly, and he was great in so many ways. But uh, for anyone with politics farther to the left, he was fairly consistently a, a disappointment, uh, not curbing the military, um, um, ramping up drone strikes, um, not really uh, acting like a winner of a peace prize. Um, so I think sometimes they're hoping for something with the prize. Uh, the peace prize is so political um, and they don't get what they, what they want. Derek, are there other awards in the world of science out there that are actually better than the Nobel Prize system? Because some scientific people, uh, some science people who've, who've got, say, the physics award, they say actually it was bad news for them because it meant that everyone assumed they had fabulous m amounts of money behind them to do what they wanted to do. So they say stopped, they, they, they had a situation where students weren't coming to them and saying, look, I'm doing my PhD, I want to work with you, how's about it? Those, those offers were just not coming through the system. I think there's a great deal of pressure once somebody does win the award to go off on the lecture circuit and it, it is possible to, to spend a lot of time travelling the world um, get, giving ticketed lectures because people are interested in, in Nobel Prize winners and they want to hear about their work and although that, that's great from a public engagement point of view it can sometimes distract from the day-to-day um, doing of science, which is which is what has won the uh, the, the award in the first place. Um, some, some scientists virtually retire uh, once they've received a Nobel Prize, and it comes because it comes towards the end of their career often, and, and that goes back to what I was mentioning earlier about the award of prizes to people for for large bodies of work, what we might call the lifetime achievement uh, Nobel prizes. It, it is slightly different in the uh, in the, the Peace Prize, as we've heard, that we might award the prize to to Greta Thunberg, who is very young, and of course a couple of years ago Malalia won for her work promoting uh, education and, and literacy among girls in Pakistan. Pakistan and Afghanistan and, and, and nearly paid for that work with, with her life. So it, it is much harder in science for a young person to win uh, that, than it is possibly uh, to, win, to win a Peace Prize. So consequently, it, it does tend to mean that it is older scientists that win and, and then often they're less active after they've won the prize. Henry Cordell in Oslo, if you had to come up with a prize system not dissimilar to Nobel, but you had a blank sheet of A4 paper, how would you change what the Nobel Committee does? I think that, that uh, most of the time they're doing their, their job uh, very well. One of the big discussions in, in Norway has been the consistency of the, uh, of the uh, committee. Uh, of course, it's given uh, for the other Nobel, Peace, uh, the other Nobel Prizes, but for the, the Peace Prize, it's been a discussion about uh, the uh, to whether or not the, the committee is sufficiently independent from the from the Norwegian government, since it's Norwegian parliament that names the, uh, the representatives. And one of the uh, big discussions uh, in Norway and internationally about the peace prize has been precisely whether we should be getting more uh, competence from the research side, more uh, international participation, uh, more organizations who work in this field to be part of the committee and part of the uh, uh, selection process uh, for the prize winners. And I think that that is perhaps the, the, the single most important uh, change that I would do. David, do you get the feeling that the committee quite enjoys sometimes mixing it up a little bit and maybe enjoying the ripple effect of the consequences? I'm thinking here about when Donald Trump was introduced to Nadia Morad. She was the Nobel Peace Prize winner. She has done some incredibly very productive, very strong, high-profile work. The President of the United States, the leader of the free world, the defender of the free world, had virtually, it would look like, if one watched it at the time, he had no idea who she was. 
<laughs> well, it's not Trump's first time being a total idiot. I mean, that that's the one thing that he's good at. Tens of millions of, of uh, you know, our, our least impressive Americans voted for him because they recognized themselves in him. So, um, yeah, it's, it's not his first moment uh, for that. Uh, it's outrageous, of course, that he's put himself forward as a possible winner uh, for the Peace Prize. Um, but everything he does is outrageous. I've actually just written a novel about him um, that's so rude it will never be published, but it made me feel a little bit better to do terrible things to him uh, every day for a year in the novel. Henrik, Mr. Trump says he would win if it's given out fairly, but of course it is given out fairly. I, I think uh, the, the chances that he is uh, getting the prize uh, uh, is uh, the chances is, is very low. He's, we know for sure that he has been uh, nominated by uh, some other members of uh, Norwegian Parliament. Uh, I think that that he needs to uh, be able to demonstrate that he's been doing. Uh, more long-lasting, uh, uh, peaceful work uh, before he would be considered seriously for the Nobel Peace Prize. Derek, we, we seem to be saying here on Inside Story that the Nobel Prize system is not irrelevant, but it needs to work at making itself more relevant. If we go back 100 years, is there maybe an indicator of that? Because Mr Nobel was fabulously wealthy, but he made his money out of making arms that were used to kill people around the world. Yes, that, that was a major motivation in setting up the prize, that uh, uh, Nobel felt that he had to, had to put something back in and he, he recognised that he was working in an industry that had uh, led, to, led to very many deaths and, and, and he wanted to pay something back. Um, he, he didn't institute a prize in mathematics, uh, I, I, interestingly, um, and the Fields Prize has sort of come in to fill that, that void. So that's the one that mathematicians go for. Um, in, in my field in biology, there are two categories that biologists can enter for. One, one of them is chemistry. Many biologists have actually won the chemistry prize rather than chemists because of advances in molecular biology. And that's usually given out for, t for technical um, innovations. And then there's the prize in physics and medicine, which biologists usually go for if they've produced something which is of great medical imp uh, importance and is going to improve uh, people's lives. So per perhaps we need, we need an extension to the Nobel Prizes to include something more relevant to the, to the modern scientific landscape, something where artificial intelligence, computer science, um, people working in, in programming and, and stuff like that can, can have a prize. Uh, the, the categories that exist at the moment reflect really what was important back when Nobel founded the prizes uh, 100 years ago. Gentlemen, runners and riders, David, we're not far away from uh, who uh, will get the awards, but who should we be looking out for, David Van, do you think, in your, in your sphere in the world of literature? Well, I hope that it goes to a woman. Um, if it were going to an American woman, I would pick Annie Prue or Marilyn Robinson. Uh, it's hard to know who it will go to. I've never been able to guess. I'm always surprised. I loved when they last awarded to Kazuo Ishiguro. Uh, he's fabulously deserving of, of the award, a wonderful writer. I think everyone was happy with that. Um, I was just in China for a month on a residency. I don't know if I'm going to say the name correctly, but Kan Shui, like, she's in the betting, uh, high in the odds to possibly win. But I don't think there's any way of telling. Um, I hope it's a woman. I hope she's not American or Canadian or European. Um, but we'll just have to see. Henry Cordal in Oslo, last word to you. Can the Nobel Prize Committee really carry on ad infinitum overlooking so many talented people, be it in the world of academia, literature, science? Why not give us an award for mathematics, say? Why not give us awards like a, a Lifetime Achievement Award even? Well, maybe that's the next step. Uh, I think uh, that there hasn't been added a, a Nobel Peace Prize, Nobel Prize since uh, since the uh, the Memorial Prize for in economics. So maybe it's time now to uh, to look into new areas. Gentlemen, we have to leave it there. Many thanks for your company. Thanks to our guests. They were Henrik Ordal, Derek Gatherer, and David Van. And thank you too for your company. You can see the program again anytime on the website aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do check out our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. We're at AJ Inside Story, or you can tweet me. I'm at Peter Dobby One. From me, Peter Dobby, and the entire team here in Doha. Bye-bye for now. I will see you very soon. Bye-bye.